okay for equal work. Join our crowd. The shooting spree only ended when the gunman shot himself dead. All of the victims were women. If you engage in it, you will be fine. Simple. Great number of sleepless nights that I am able to talk of these unpleasant matters. Peel me a grape, crush me some ice, skin me a peach, save the fuzz for my pillow. Just entertain me, champagne me, show me you love me, kid love me. Best way to cheer me, cashmere me. I'm getting hungry, peel me a grape. Okay. There's a lot of just blaming of men for not being the way women think they ought to be. It's not true that men are favored in all areas of life, that there's areas where we are disadvantaged. You can be excluded from the lives of the children and expected to be a wall of it. How might I use these gifts and abilities to move towards gender equality? What we're doing here is the start of the real gender revolution, the movement out of scripted roles for men and women into real authenticity and, and you know, self-discovery and what kind of work in, the, in pursuit of this vision would I want to do? When I was going through my uh, three-year battle for custody of my kids, uh, my ex-wife uh, phoned the police twice and had me removed from her our house at the time and uh, had charges laid against me for assault which were eventually dropped and thrown out. And it was quite humiliating to deal with the, uh, the police officers who were involved in the spousal uh, abuse unit because I feel they did have a definite bias against, against men. This is a picture of my daughter Adrian, and uh, she's eight and a half now. I've been separated from her since she was about two, so it's been six and a half years now, and uh, she's been moving to, uh, to the States. I keep in touch with her by calling her every day. We have some conversations. Um, you can imagine that those conversations every day, just for five minutes a day, can be sometimes awkward, but I've been imaginative over, over time. Um, she plays uh, piano for me, I listen to her songs. to get in my daughter's life again. That's really powerful for me to do right now. After signing the divorce paper. 10 years ago, uh, my third marriage failed. And uh, uh, again, I finally realized that one of the main reasons it did was because I didn't love myself well enough to love anybody else. Yeah. It was just, to me, uh, like a tidal wave of uh, history. When my, my wife left me, 1987. She did so. Uh, she took. She told me she was going to the vet to take the dog to the vet. And she called me up and said, "I've left you." And I said, "Well, why did you do it that way?" And she said, "Well, I was afraid you'd be violent." And I thought, you know, like, who does she think I am? You know, this is the woman that I was married to for eight years, and. I've never been violent in my adult life, and I've never even imagined being violent with her. And so it seemed to me like she wasn't seeing me, she was seeing a stereotype. And she was afraid of a stereotype of a person that I wasn't. And I started thinking about that. I had a couple of restaurants and I worked all the time so that I could get enough money and then we'd have this great life together. And I missed a big chunk of my child's years. I was a single parent for a year, and that's what I see what's not being spoken. This men live up to this idea that they're supposed to be in society and fulfill on it, and the payoff doesn't turn out like it's advertised. She's not real happy when you come home, especially after you work an extra four hours. She's in bed or maybe out sleeping with somebody else because she wants some company. but. 
But that isn't in the media. That isn't in the story that we see in the magazines. Water melting. Pour it right in the middle of his head. Go. Make the splash. That's it. Perfect. Here we go. Beautiful. As more women get an education, more women enter the workplace, more women can support themselves and their children. The you know, traditional role of men as you know, father and supporter is attenuated, which is why I think we've seen a shift in the popular culture to beautiful men. Okay, so you're Brad Pitt. That don't impress me much. Men and women are are intimately connected, you know, and that there's there's this dance going on. And unfortunately, women have only recognized the male part of the dance because that's the one that they're focused on. And we've got to inform the whole of society about the women, female part of the dance. Like for instance, um, the way that uh, we're told about men, all they want is sex, you know, the thing behind the sex object. Well, what's the woman's part of that? Well, the woman's part of that is that women don't have sex with just anybody. For them, you know, it's about, oh, if I'm gonna have sex with you, I'm gonna let you touch my body, that means that you're, you're selected out of all those other guys. You're a special guy. Well, that's what the guys want, right? Cashing in They wanna the feel like, you know, I'm a worthy guy. And the part that we get that from women is when I let you be with my body. Well, we often talk about the the female as being a sex object, but then the male as being a success object. Uh, in my experience, what happened was uh, I felt my wife, my ex-wife, wanted to trade up. All of a sudden, she had achieved equality with me, and and now it was like, well, I'm not so sure I'm happy with equality, and I, I, what I really need now is um, to move up and to get a man who who can, who's richer, who who who's better educated. Carb and status. Uh, certain income meant status, uh, clothes that you wore meant status, all of this. And I found that not only men, but, but certain women bought into that whole idea as well, uh, in that they were looking for a man who represented or had all of these different qualities. And if, of course, if you didn't, then you were sort of left with a deficit. Most men um, would feel more comfortable or, or more able to express ourselves if there weren't so many fixed ideas about what we're supposed to be. Now, I think for a lot of men, we're used to that, and we don't really feel that it's a liability, the fact that we're expected to support a family, take the brunt of that, and uh, if there's a noise in the house, we have to be the ones to go downstairs and risk death if it's an armed intruder, and the fact that we're the ones that are expected to go off and fight in the military and potentially die. we get our value from women. My mother was the primary caregiver. So who I am gets to be defined by women. From the day that a little boy, a baby is born, the pressure is for the mother to let go, to move back. It's dangerous for him to be too close to you because in some way you're gonna feminize him. Look up for me, look at the baby. There's the baby. Okay. A woman is a dominatrix of the universe, essentially. That woman rules the sexual realm she, by, by virtue of being mistress of birth. That every, every boy staggers out from the shadow of a mother goddess and, and has to break free of his mother's influence to become a man. So the Men have traditionally <clears throat> got their moral affirmation from women. You know, women have decided who were good men and who were bastards. We've projected a lot onto women, a lot of expectation for affirming who we are, validating who we are, so, so much so that when we don't get it from them, somehow uh, we're destroyed or devastated or uh, we're, just, we're just empty. We've got to figure out that we can define that for ourselves, discover that for ourselves and not need to get it from women. And the dark side of that moral uh, authority, of course, is that it's used to shame men. Shame is the great controller of men. Mm -hmm. 
I don't care what it adds yeah, to that, but that's... Right from, uh, <laughs> okay. Maybe half in school, you know. go to court for any access issues, when your relationship is breaking down, be a logical step as well to say, hey. Totally different thing. Be mother and father and to the kid on a long-term basis and on a, on a short-term basis. Um, and I think uh, given the families that we grew up in and the models that we had from our own fathers. In my family, mothers, basically. my mother was the had a lot of the masculine traits, if you like. You know, she was the one who was clearly the, the dominant one in the relationship. My father was quite passive and quite submissive, and she kind of controlled things. And she was very, um, very aggressive and very uh, shaming. Um, and she was very unhappy, you know. And I saw that, uh, that she blamed everybody, particularly my father and me, all the time for her unhappiness. And my father kind of took it, you know. He, he didn't know how to set his boundaries and say, no, that's not mine, that's yours. You know, he would just say, oh, well, I'll try to do better, and, you know. Well, I, uh, I never really bonded with my father as a child. I identified with my mother. And I never really successfully separated from her emotionally. And uh, I've grown up and I've had my own family and I've been in a couple of relationships, long-term relationships. Uh, but I've, you know, become aware that uh, really uh, uh, there's, a, there's a masculine side to me that uh, I never, uh, was never satisfied. What oftentimes, well, to my mind, I just speak my own mind. My mind is that we're still operating in a class society and culture. There's, there's something to be seen about this. So there are some solutions, but I think one of the problems is that I don't think it's simply a matter of doing psychotherapy on enough people and the world changes. And, and it, most importantly, imagine if we took all that away from children. Uh, in which he had studied, uh, worked with men in the you know, state of Massachusetts prison system. And he asked him, why are you so violent? And what he found out was that they spoke, they said, they were responding to being dissed. Now that's short for disrespected. And he, he concluded that shame was the dominant force that creates violence. When people speak of, of the men's movement, some type of conservative backlash. I mean, myself, I was involved in civil rights in the 60s, left that to raise my children, worked two jobs for years so that we could have a stay-at-home parent, and all of a sudden, when my re relationship broke up, that was used as a reason why I should not see my kids. And that's where men go, wait a minute here. <laughs> I was it's working a hundred... standard. I was doing my job 110%, and because I was, I lose my kids, and as importantly, my kids lose me. <laughs> this is why... It, What's this... wrong with this picture? You just cannot get preschool childcare off the ground. You won't get it off the ground until you put money into the sector. If you give the money to women, that's where it will be spent. If you give it to men, it'll be spent on leisure, prostitution, pornography, alcohol. It's just true. If we wrote a uh, favorable policy uh, that would allow a, a non-custodial parent to have some access at school as far as being notified of school functions, report cards, um, maybe having lunch with their child, Right now, what we're doing is actually trying to get, as happens in other countries, I mean, each Father's Day, uh, Bill Clinton makes a speech about that. You know, I'm working on trying to get, you know, um, our leaders to speak out on Father's Day and say something positive about this. I'm getting some support for members of Parliament. Wow. They've captured my personality perfectly. Did you see the way Daddy caught that bullet? That's not really you, Dad. He's just a fictional character who happens to have the same name. Don't confuse Daddy, Lisa. The father in Simpsons, Homer, is, <laughs> is a jerk. <laughs> in terms of the media, I think it's, it's simply reporting what's common in the culture itself. Um, I'm bothered by uh, any kind of reportage that fathers are irresponsible. And yet, that seems to be quite common. I'm not sure if that's, you know, how much of that is true. Nobody give a f about Daddy. 
Everybody take daddy for granted. Just listen to the radio. Everything's mama, then mama. I always love my mama. Mama, mama, mama. What's the daddy song? Papa was a rolling star. Father of mine, tell me where have you been? You know I just closed my eyes. My whole world is up here. Father of mine, take me back to the day. Yeah, when I was still your golden boy, back before you went away. I remember blue skies walking the blind. The first other in the child's life is the father. Fathers talk to their children differently. The physical relationship is different. The discipline is done differently by mothers and by fathers. The whole issue of risk taking and pushing to the limits is handled, tends to be handled somewhat differently by mothers and fathers, with fathers often encouraging sort of the pushing out and mothers wanting safety, security, protection of the child in that sense. Originally, uh, parenting was viewed, at least, as, as strong participation by fathers. It was viewed as responsibility for the moral, uh, spiritual, and the um, uh, occupational, the work development life of the child. Now, we've switched that around, and so that parenting now means child care, changing the diapers, feeding the kid, dressing the kid. It's, it's no longer, it's quite a, it has become strongly feminized. And we have, you know, men who are, per who are trying to raise their families and aren't allowed to. I think we have to, to bring that issue forward as, you know, I mean, we got to the stage where uh, we recognize everything that the mother does, but we recognize nothing that the father does. There is a, an individual excelling in men. I think those masculine qualities have been denigrated by society. They're not valued as they should be. There's a rightness to mathematical theories. There's a rightness to music. There's a rightness of, um, to men's inventions. They work. You know, that's what we expect of men. It must work. John Earl on CFRA this afternoon says it's been very frustrating for crews who've been working hard in dangerous conditions over the last four days to turn around and see... There was an expert on emergency response talking, on being interviewed on the radio, and he was asked about, uh, you know, well, what about the gender factors in this? And he said, yeah, you know, um, the, uh, the um, men, uh, you, you, you've got to worry about the women you know, left home to fend for themselves while the guys, while the men are out, you know, climbing the fire poles and fixing the, the, um, you know, the, the power and so on, right? And I thought, wow, like that's, there it is, all in a nutshell. Um, our attention is on the issues of women in a patronizing kind of way, like, you know, they might not be able to take care of themselves in their, in their homes. And we're sort of taking for granted the fact that men are out there risking their lives climbing you know, power poles sheathed in ice, working with live hydro cables and so on. Like, that's sort of the expected thing. That's what men do. <laughs> this weekend was very different from last year's weekend. Last year, we tried to formulate the, the mission and the direction. And this year was more of a practical um, exercise where we translated those missions and directions into concrete action. Something that we largely lost forgotten how to do in our culture, to do this with the knowledge that you're blessed in this work. I was very encouraged by the fact that there was more women involved and uh, the movement's really taking a, a shift from um, a men's movement to more of a focus on gender reconciliation. I'm committed to encouraging a a broader view of sexuality and gender equality. And I'm in hope. Oh. How could anyone ever tell you you were anything less than beautiful? So this really is about relearning for ourselves how to make connections, not just deeper connections with, with women, but with, with men, because that's what's really missing. And to, to be able to share each other's stories and to, to come together, because I think men are tired, sick and tired of being sick and tired of suffering alone. I mean, there's a level at which I think men are simple, you know, and that's, you know, men are focused on solving problems and you know, trying to find the shortest way to the solution. and, and that kind of thing, um, efficiency. 
But, it, you know, the complexity is in the inner life. And as I say, it's that, that's an untold story. Men are very, very simple creatures. And I think yeah. that women sometimes make them far more complicated than they mm -hmm. really are. You ever had any pop? <laughs> no, but I think it's about time I did. Well, young man ought to get a little pop now and then, I suppose. Still, it could get him into a lot of trouble in the form of a big brown belly. They got you coming and going. Yes, they do, boy. Man's got to squeeze in between the coming and the going. Everybody tends to see other people the way they feel they are. And women are very complicated, uh, but men are not so complicated. Hey, hey. I wrote this for my girlfriend. <clears throat> Baby, you're a woman, and that's the opposite of a man, which means you're really good looking. Um, although your driving could still improve. That's as far as I got. It's far enough. Great. Right. That's what more you need. <laughs> Certainly, I don't think that women in general understand men, but neither do I think that men in general understand women. We are each mysteries to each other. The difference is that men know they don't understand women. Women think they understand men. We have to tell the stories of men's inner lives. And in particular, we have to break off the cover story that men are in control and men are, you know, are always sort of strong. And inside, men are just as afraid and as wounded and as uh, anxious as we're familiar with women being, but it's not manly to show that. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.